We're going to resume. Thank you very much. Some of you have spent your afternoon here, and I thank you for that. If you're new to the room, um, restrooms are straight through that door. There's another one straight through this door, two more down below. Um, we're grateful to the Unitarian Society of Woodstock for the North Chapel, which is a great room for poetry. Um, what else do I need to remind you? Please turn off cell phones or any other device that will squeak or shout at inopportune moment. And looks like nobody's eating a sandwich. I'm supposed to ask that there be no food in the room, so we're fine with that. Vivi Francis was born in West Texas. She's the author of three books, most recently Forest Primeval, winner of the 2017 Kingsley Tuft Award, and a Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry, which is named for the writers Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright. Previously, Horse in the Dark, winner of a Cave Canem Northwestern University Poetry Prize, and Blue Tail Fly. She earned an MFA from the University of Michigan, and she received a Rona Jaffe Award in 2009. She has also been recipient of fellowships from Cave Canem, the Kresge Foundation, Francis currently serves as editor for the literary journal Callaloo and teaches English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. While some of her new book, this is Forest Primeval, some of this book's poems take place in the quote-unquote incinerated cities of like that that she recalls from childhood and from Detroit, many pieces in Forest Primeval are situated in the countryside of southern Appalachia. For those of us who live here in the northerly reaches of that mountain range, these poems' evocation of fauna and flora and weather readily call to mind the kindred woodlands of New England. I love the summer abundance in the poem Happy. I'm going to read you a little piece of this. In this moment where no axe falls with more trees than might be named, and the blooms ever blooming, in a heat seemingly ceaseless in the red-throated woodpeckers, as the tree frogs mating endlessly on the same limbs a black bear might loll from, indolent and berry full. Poems are made of sounds. and Listen to these gorgeous acoustics. Blooms and blooming, heat, seam, cease, tree, then red, peckless, mating, and same, and the subtle, perceptible progression of L's in falls to lull to indolent to full. Vivi Francis can bound from the spiked eloquence of the blues to sonorities that echo compressed Dickinson and profuse Whitman, sensual Keats and Oracula Shelley, somber Dunn and bountiful Shakespeare, and the majestic King James Bible. In the poem Altruism, the phrasing and diction are imbued with our literary ancestry. Give me the fruit I may leave my mark upon, or flesh willing enough, but something, something besides lip and the language of loss. Give me the pleasure of knowing the give, giving matters to more than the receiver, and given such knowledge, give me faith or denial or truth enough to manage this truth such as it is. Oh, yes. Let's welcome Vivi Francis. I was saying earlier that New England has quite a number of churches which makes my parents very happy because they're so certain I'm going straight to hell. So, perhaps I might be saved. I'm going to be reading mostly from um, my book, Forest Primeval, and then a few poems for the book coming out, The Shared World. Another attempt the secret story is the one we'll never know, although we're living it from day to day. Roberto Bolaño. But we do know the secret story, at least we each know our own secret story, and if we're brave enough, we might share it. And if the party we share it with is honest, 
they may admit it. And from there, hands held, we walk into the cave or dip our hands into the well or meander up a narrow stairwell into a dark store or a speakeasy. The secret to knowing the secret is to speak, but we too often tell the stories that are of no matter and avoid the one that does. We are bound by the secret story nonetheless, so you think by now we tell it, at least to each other. Happy. I would not say so. Rather, settled in this moment where no axe falls. And one might wonder why not happy in such an idyllic place with more trees than might be named and the blooms ever blooming in a heat ceaseless as the red-throated woodpeckers, as the tree frogs mating endlessly on the same limbs a black bear might loll from, indolent and berryful. You have heard me say nature will have its way that we build only way stations. I was proud. I thought I understood. But now I have come to this blue ridge, which rests its toll. My sleep grows longer. My dreams follow into my days. I have begun to name the birds by their feathering, their calls and clamor, nightjar, plover. Before the mountain, I knew the incinerated cities. I knew another south. But that was before I was another, the one I am becoming, as roots reclaim this soil, as what is felled takes on a form it could not have imagined, whose seeds had always rested below, like a sorrow of banjos. A flight of swiftlets made their way in and settled along my cage, so expectantly beautiful their swerve, I wanted to touch them, to take their tiny frames and snap their necks. Tell me you haven't felt that way. Tell me you haven't wanted to stifle what hovers dumb before your heart. I hollowed myself into a cave for others. I opened wide as a tomb from which the stone has been rolled, and in they flew to the emptiness of me, where they made themselves a home, nested lickety-split in my walls. I have never been whole. So there was room. Now inside, I am less inclined to hurt them, but consider taking flight myself, windborne from some vertiginous place, and why not, with so many wings within, beating and beating and beating and beating. Like Jesus to the crows, that gathered there along his arms upon the invitation of a slender limb and not oblivious to human violence, perhaps needed rest or needed to offer the succor of presence despite the stiff collar of their feathers, despite each one being no less the children of a father who claimed an upper realm. It is not true they pecked his eyes, nor did they consider his wounds their own. They were neither irreverent nor quiet. They spoke in the tongues they knew. They cawed full-voiced and would have released him from his bindings had their beaks held the power and had there been time in that place. Like them, I have sought to comfort and be so comforted. Like them, I have seen the failure of miracles when they were most needed. And like him, I have called upon those so unlike myself when my own father failed to answer. Taking it for Gabby Calvacresi and Jen Groats. I never remember the knuckles, though his hand was bare, though their hands were bare. I remember the impressions left on this skin, the wilting and welting. I don't remember the sound, not one smack. I remember the falls myself falling to the floor or sidewalk or against the brick wall my head met after a push. There were many pushes. Girls pushed, but I punched, pulled one down by the hair and kneed her as my own head bled. 
Girls didn't punch until high school. What kind of girl are you, my father asked. The kind who wants to live, I said. And I did want to, until I didn't anymore. But I wanted the leaving to be on my own terms, so I hit my father back. He owned me like any good country father. He waited for a husband to tame what he couldn't corral, to throw a rope like fingers round a neck. And when I missed a boy, finger holes, I remember those, and me making a fist wrongly and punching, and I didn't mean to miss, but to hit that line below the belly, the belt line. When broke me in the snow my first year north, I'm still afraid to say his name. I wore shoes too thin for the weather. Who had ever seen such snow? And had a Georgia lilt, like molasses on a sore throat, sugared, raw, and he hated the sound of it. He was black, and I was black, and I was so happy to be in Detroit, and he aimed for my heart-shaped mouth, my gap teeth, my too sweet tongue. I felt the juvenile weight of him above me like snow after dark, falling steady and hard. I'm going to teach you to talk regular. And I stopped speaking at all. I kept my swollen mouth shut and a straight razor in my math book and dreamt of a bat to crack against his chest. A woman like me, ultimately with soft hands, not hands of the field like my grandmother, but hands meant to soothe, needs a weapon. So I studied the art of war and watched boxing. And where else was all this rage to go? Is this too dramatic? Find another story. Find a lie. In love, body after body fell beneath my own, though my own was broken, and I made love like a sea creature, fluid as if boneless, though my bones would rattle if not for this fat I cherish, wouldn't you? And how I grew to love the heavyweights, myself with one in the ring. Imagine him punching me and punching me again, saying, I'm sorry, so sorry to have to love you this way. Skinned. There are, after all, several ways to skin anything. My grandmother knew most of those ways. She had been skinned herself, so to speak, and that her skin was so often examined and found wanting. What would one want to do with it, really? Despite the constant oiling, which left her arms soft as anyone could possibly desire, her hands were ruins. She never hit me with them. My grandfather took her with her hands at her sides. Laundry, water, cotton, bulls, horse, hide, the blood of goats. She had to cook and I had to eat. She could skin a raccoon in minutes, revealing the purple flesh easy as snapping a guinea neck. She would have given anything to wake up in a new skin, though hers was delightful in the light, but what did I know? And though her face barely wrinkled, her knees and elbows darkened into the skin I wear now, roughened into the heels I scratch against a husband's calves, because I don't listen. I refuse to wear shoes. I'm as country as she didn't want me to be. I loved the way she smelled, like outdoors, like new sheets, like hot grease and rifle burn, cream of wheat with coffee, front porch, corn cob. Her skin held all she did her best to scrub free, scrub so hard it liked to take the skin right off of her, which was what she wanted, to have it off on her own terms, not the eyes that demonized her as unsightly, dirty, unseemly. She saved for lace, for crinolines, for pretty gloves and wide-brimmed hats to hide her skin. Mine is mottled, stress-blemished, but soft as hers, and I know it, easy enough to remove, as a girl, I tried to burn it off, to find the pink I was convinced lay beneath. I'm not the first. I wore scarves she made to cover the evidence of my curiosity. I give myself over now to the lotions of the day, disparage the oils she did not love but felt she needed. She'd stroke my cheek and say, good baby, and I'd feel good in my skin in that moment. I'd hold her tight and whisper, you are the prettiest, and she'd feel good in hers. I want to forget, but I have my mirrors, and there she is, shadowed in a sunstruck field.
bluster. So several of the poems in this book, uh, they're looped around each other. Poems on wolves, poems on bears, poems on my grandmother, poems on the farm I lived in, in on as a child, and the Blue Ridge Mountains where it meets the Smokies around Asheville, North Carolina. And in between, I spent 30 years in the city of Detroit. So by the time I got to North Carolina, there was nothing rural about me, right? I wanted planted trees in pots on my balcony in Chelsea, New York, where trees are supposed to be. I didn't want them all around me. So I wrote this book in response to suddenly finding myself in this kind of rurality. And we literally lived inside of a forest. So, um, again, fairy tales came up. And this is Bluster. It opens with an epigraph by Charles Perrault. It is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. Little Red Riding Hood. I knew the path and what was on it. I wore his favorite color. He said, I could just eat you up as if I were a girl whose cheeks he could pinch into a blush, pluck a bit off, and pop onto his tongue. I held a rustic basket of his favorite cheeses, a board and knife. Beneath my coat I wore nothing. He wore short sleeves that made him seem hairier than if he had worn nothing at all, imbalanced somehow, the clean line of the linen, the tufts of hair spinning down his arms. Every spring I took the path, Every spring he surprised me with his hair-raising antics, bucking his eyes, biting his lips. He'd sharpened the edges of his teeth. He'd learned my middle name. But ask him my favorite hue. Go on. And he never bothered to ask how I've been. He had the feet of a much larger wolf. He wore shoes like any huntsman. I wanted to knock mine upon them to test their strength. I said, I've been away studying. He said, don't you want to guess what I'm holding? I laughed, because what else was there to do? I knew his type. He was clever. Though he couldn't unsnap my lamb's wool, he cut through it with a claw in the grove. So clean a line, you couldn't tell my red cape from the blood beneath it. Just a circle, a hole, I dropped my act. I smiled a heartless smile. I arched my back and cried only a little, really. I was my grandmother's granddaughter, after all. This poem, I'm going to try it. I never read this poem above the Mason-Dixon, right? Matthew, do you know what poem I'm going to read? He's scared. (laughs) He's like, Lord knows, right? Um, So I don't think people eat them up here, and people have stopped eating them so much in the South, and a lot of my friends pretend they don't eat them, but then they'll sneak to my house once a year and eat them. So um, they're pig intestines, chitlins. Like tripe is the stomach, chitlins are the intestines and they are so yummy to me but I mean I grew up on that in raccoon so there you go um so my grandpa was known for making his chitlins and I wrote this for him I am the only one I know who can cook them and my grandpa did was in fact known for several counties round for his way with a pot of them so after hearing the great poet read about chitlins I cried in my car for an hour without sucker. I had said, I get your poem, and not many of us will buy into chitlins anymore, and you and I are covering similar territory in our poems. But all the great poet heard was a local and was busy signing books while I was busy being embarrassed. I was no yokel, but there I was with my sun-modeled face and my memories of ham-hocked collards and the cloy of cornbread and yams like a cologne coming off my skin, betraying my my background of jukes and longhorns, sulfur eight, Christmas coon, the rusting hose and spades. But I'm the kind of goat that means to get up the goddamn mountain, no matter if that means what howls or rips into me. So years later, when the great poet, having heard of me, whispered, I'm going to take you to my secret barbecue joint. I knew I was not off the mark, that we held in common a kind of heat, brine from the mason jar, hot gem, whatever slides easily from the bone. And anyone Texas-born like myself knows the secret joint 
is the for real God Almighty sauce, where there's mud on the floor and the pork smells like the lover you wish you had or do, where there's a fan overhead and it ain't cooling nothing down, and you know your uncle would love this place so he don't need to know. Neither does your daddy. Where, as you spoon up the peppers, your tongue remembers itself and the vernacular you let go. That real talk climbs your leg like a good bitch lost to a hound or down your spine like a red ant under the collar. And then you come back to yourself. Know yourself now for the earthy motherfucker you are. Ain't that right, though? And you leave this place stained and smoked and grateful you stayed so long where nobody blinks when a bit of brisket is spit accidentally through the gap of a smile, where no one is embarrassed by what they love to eat or must. You can talk to me about that afterwards. I find that interesting. I want to know how that reads for the northern ear. This is um, another new one. Um, Those of you who are older recall the Birmingham bombing and the four little girls that died in that bombing. Finally, the men who committed the crime um, were brought to justice, but by that time they were very, very old. Well, the man who set the bomb was Bobby Frank Cherry. Bobby Frank Cherry is buried maybe 50 miles from my mother. When he left um, Alabama, he went to Texas. And I lived in maybe the woods next to him and didn't know it. I lived next to this little black girl killer. And so this is entitled, On the Piney Woods, Death, Bobby Frank Cherry and Me. Sometimes I wander around wondering where my mother is. The family buried her next to her own mother, Out there, the hard pines darken early. Anyone can hide and not be found for years. Frank Cherry laid low there. The girls came in his dreams. You can't live in those woods and not be haunted by what you've done. So he had to be more given to visitation than most. They wouldn't have come whole. They would have arrived in bits and pieces the way he left them. They would have held bits of church brick and holy bric-a-brac. They might have come as a glove or a hat small enough for their child's heads. I imagine they were laughing or singing before the bomb went off. So they may have moved through the house as voices or the tiny tap of a shoe. I lived out there in those piney woods when he did. I didn't know he was there. It makes sense. It was a place inhabited by the lost and the found, by horror and grace. I am haunted by memories as present as ghosts. I believe in ghosts and am grateful I have committed no crimes. Though I am untouchable, I was born so, under four pounds, bent leg pale and stricken. I went straight into an incubator, a metal tit, monkeyed against a glass and wire frame. The girls would have been only a few years older than me. They died as I was born. They were blown to the winds. I was born into the storm of them. I cannot hold it all together, the pieces of them, of me. My mother hated my needing to touch her, to have her in my sight, young and free enough to flit and flirt away into an evening. I'd cry myself sick whenever she left. I wound myself around her when she returned and could feel the wince in her gaze and her gloved hands pushing me away. When we are unloved, does it matter who doesn't love us? She didn't hate me. No crime was committed. Had Frank known I lived down the road, he would have hated me. I knew early on I could be blown to bits by any white man with enough rage. Some are unwanted and live. Some are erased. It's not a matter of degree. It's a matter of intent. Those girls were loved. Why aren't they here? Why am I? And I'll end here with a poem for Matthew. Mm -hmm. The Company of Wolves. The epigraph from Handel, All we like sheep have gone astray. You found me where the forest was black as broken piping sticking out from cement and the ash that fell like snow when the factory was torn down 
and the snow itself present half the year. There were no coyotes, but cats just as feral and mad as any abandoned being becomes. That year, the rats froze into the ice, and quicker, hungrier rats ate off their heads that poked just above the ice line, leaving their bodies to be clearly seen an eternal struggle. The sight disgusted you who walked the alleys. You loved to walk the edge, so there was nothing I could say. And I wanted to warn you about the wolves, but you didn't fear them. You feared for me. Cities like ours are as full of wolves as dogs. They leave no footprints. There is always more than one. They can smell a sheep like me. And I can't tell a wolf from a neon sign. I move toward the brilliant lights like the charm of a glinting watch the hypnotist swings back and forth. I will embrace any bright-eyed creature, and if not for you, lay it on my pillows. A wolf can pretend otherwise until you are asleep. That's how the granny was taken in that old story. She took the beast in and let it sleep beside her. The only thing it left was her cap, which he put on his own head. So believe me, the difference between a wolf in the forest and one on the street is that one lives on the street. The streets I walk when I am restless, wearing red and wanting to make friends. How many times have you taken me out of a sharp-toothed mouth just before I was swallowed whole? Why do you think I follow your staff and only come when you call? Thank you.